from London. This is me, Julian. And Jenna Lee. Good morning. Good well, afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to the introduction to philosophy and theory class. We're going to be starting this, I don't know, this lecture series right here, right now. It's going to be an introduction to the works of Slavoj Žižek, Lacan, psychoanalysis, Hegel, Kant, Marx, what have you. And this lecture series is entitled The Useless Precaution. If you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here, starting your week off with us in a philosophical manner. Um, Jen Ling usually has a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I do. Yes, we last week just put out Julian's uh, ebook to correspond with the previous lecture series. So if you're interested in not watching 12 hours worth of live stream, you can instead download the ebook. The ebook is available on our Patreon. Got lots of other stuff there, uh, Discord, lecture uh, transcripts. So the link should be in the bio. Um, we also think that we have a car alarm <laughs> going off periodically so if you hear that we're just gonna try and go through it we've had it all on these trips we've had the <laughs> whistling of wind through windows and now we have the car alarm it's the opposite um, of the vanishing mediator just want to say a big thank you to Jenlin for continuing to set up these classes to host the patreon to be the patreon guru mm -hmm. for helping me edit the book um and as you said my book five keys to zizek where nothing is lacking is currently available exclusively on patreon Huge thank you to those of you who have already subbed and purchased the book. Um, Jenlene told me that a couple of people have already written to her saying that they are enjoying it, which makes me very happy. And it's basically a very short introduction to the philosophical ideas that animate Slavoj Žižek's work. So the book is called Five Keys to Žižek, Where Nothing is Lacking. And each of the five chapters introduces one of the key philosophical influences that will hopefully help you understand and enhance your own reading and study of Slavoj Žižek's works. For example, who is the most sublime hysteric? What is the sublime object of ideology? Who is tickling the tickless subject? Mm -hmm. And more. If you'd like to have the answers to those questions, you can find that in my ebook called Five Keys to Žižek, where nothing is lacking. Um, basically, the idea of the book was to solve a problem, which is that I know a lot of people here enjoy the lectures and the movies and the books of Slavoj Žižek, but they tend to be ever so slightly associative. There's a lot of it to get through. And so what I've tried to do in this book is in a very condensed form, basically presented some of the key philosophical influences. So the Lacanian subject of the unconscious, the idea of the Kantian versus the Hegelian sublime, the idea of the Freudian hysteric, all of that basically compressed into a very short ebook that will hopefully aid you in your enjoyment and study of Slavoj Žižek. So that book, as Jenny said, is available exclusively on Patreon where you can download it today. All right. Uh, anything else before we start? Or Okay. We'll see. <laughs> no, I'm just going to wait. Just, I'm just going to uh, wait for you to start before no, I no. interject. Well, usually you have something about people coming. Let us know where you are joining us feels from. Wrong, Sorry. Right? It feels know. wrong somehow if we don't like, have that. It doesn't feel like Monday morning. But as Julian <laughs> mentioned, yes, we are on the road. We've been on the road for a little while. It's starting to catch up with us a bit, I suppose. But we are here in London, England for another couple of weeks. And so let us know in the comments where you are joining us from, because we love that this really is a global learning community. Our goal has always been to provide open access education, which is why all of these classes are 100% free and are archived online. And it's more classes than we can even remember. So <laughs> <laughs> enjoy. I'm seeing New York, upstate New York, South Africa. That's, that's, that's amazing. A, that's really amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're so, so grateful to be doing this. We see someone from Iran. We, we see you and we, we were so glad. Someone from, Ka from Kashmir, which is amazing. Um, Poland. It really makes us very happy to be doing this in a fashion that feels connected and international. So thank you so much for letting us know where you're joining us from. Um, okay, so we're going to be further investigating in this class Slavoj Žižek's theory of violence, Žižek on violence. Um, but along the way, we're going to talk about a couple different things. We're going to talk about the difference between the imaginary and the symbolic within Lacanian psychoanalysis. I want to talk about The Northman, which is a movie that I saw recently. We might have a little bit of Doctor Strange thrown in there as well, another film that I saw recently. So yeah, if you'd like to join us for the next hour or so, make yourself comfortable. This is going to be a 60-minute lecture. Uh, or you could download the entire class as a podcast exclusively on Patreon. Okay, so I'm just going to jump right in. 
So, a couple of days ago, I saw a film called The Northman. And I realized that the popular sort of common sense response to The Northman, at least the so-called critique that I've seen online, has been to essentially suggest that the movie is problematic. Problematic in a very specific way, namely that it has been embraced by neo-Nazis and other people on the reactionary right. And, and this isn't necessarily surprising. I mean, it's a film that is very, very graphic in its depiction of a certain type of masculinity, this idea of like a barbaric slash pre-modern civilization. It's like the of, Scandi 500. Of Vikings, yeah. etc., mm -hmm. battling each other. And so it's easy to understand why some people would take that and would say, well, this is problematic. This is proto-fascist. This is sort of the liberal response to most things that tend to be excessively violent or masculine in nature. For example, when the movie 300 came out, there was a similar response that the movie 300 was proto-fascist. Now, I want to make the argument here that nothing could be less true, that this movie is in fact quite the opposite of proto-fascist, that this movie in many ways undermines and shows the inevitable decline of a certain type of logic within the pre-modern world. And I'm going to do that in a way that hopefully is not so academic, but that serves as an illustration for some <laughs> other things. Now, oh, there goes the car alarm. No, the car alarm didn't stand. Okay, so the Northman. Some people have said that the Northman is proto-fascist, that the way in which it depicts masculinity and violence and brutality and the way it's been embraced by certain reactionary people on the right online is quote-unquote problematic, supposedly proto-fascist. And I think that nothing could be less true. And here's why. First of all, you have to understand that the two pivotal sequences of the movie relate to a father-son relationship. And we see two different, very different father-son relationships. We see on the one hand, the main character, the quote unquote barbaric prince who is on a quest to avenge the death of his father who in the beginning of the film is initiated through a kind of animalistic rite. And then we have another father-son scene where we have the usurper uncle with his own progeny, young son, and together they are building a hut. Now, what's interesting about the first scene, the first father-son relationship, is that the bond that they have is a bond by which they have to quote-unquote prove their bestial nature, that they together are engaging in a shamanic rite by which the name of the father, the symbolic name of the father, as Lacan would call it, is passed on to the imaginary attribution of the son. Whereas in the other one, we have a much more interesting, much more modern, potentially Hegelian relationship between the father and the son, which I will get to in a moment, when the father essentially tells the son that he should be working as if the slaves were watching him. I want to get to that in a moment, but first let's put in place some of the key concepts that I'm trying to use here. Because ultimately I want to use the film as an example of these concepts, not the other way around. That's always been my purpose, is essentially to say, let's use the movie as a way to illustrate what are otherwise seemingly difficult philosophical and psychoanalytic concepts. Not let's use philosophy and psychoanalysis to make this movie more enjoyable. Although it can be a little bit of a, I don't know, it can be a dialectic, you could say. Now, as I talked about in the previous class, we have a difference for Lacan French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, between the imaginary and the symbolic. The imaginary is how you see yourself. The symbolic is how others observe you. Now, what's important to note here is that the symbolic isn't literally how other people observe you. Instead, the symbolic is how you observe yourself as if you were being observed by somebody else. For Lacan, this is also the difference between the ego ideal and the ideal ego. The ego ideal is the imaginary. The ego ideal is how you relate to your own self, which is in turn related to the ideal ego. The ideal ego being for Lacan, the name of the father or the symbolic. And so small i o for Lacan is related to the imaginary. It's the relationship that you have to yourself. Big i o is related to the symbolic or the name of the father. And once again, they're not separate. They're dialectically intertwined, which means that they're pre-mediated. The small I-O relates to the big I-O because the small I-O imagines that the big I-O is real. In other words, your relationship to the way in which you observe yourself is related to the way in which you believe you are observed by others. 
For Lacan, it's the name of the father because of the primordial relationship. For Lacan, it's the way in which the father observes the son, which allows the son to observe himself as a person. This is at the basis of the so-called Oedipal complex for Freud. It's not just saying that you want to assert or kill your father in order to lay with the mother. It's specifically that the precondition for selfhood is realizing that the way in which the father observes you has to be mediated through your own realization of your own self. Now, what Lacan is essentially stating here is a chiasmic structure. You may have already noticed it. We have the ego ideal and the ideal ego. And the ego ideal and the ideal ego are a chiasmic structure because we essentially have A, B, B, A. We have ego, ideal, ideal, ego. Which means that the ego doesn't come first, nor does the ideal come second. Instead, what we have is subjectivity, a symptomatic subjectivity that emerges precisely within the breaking point, the point of repression for Lacan, between the ego ideal and the ideal ego, between the small I-O and the big I-O, which for those of you who are already more well-versed with Lacan will immediately come to suspect are synonymous or analogous with the idea of the little other and the big other. The little other is how you relate to your own self, the imaginary attachment that you have to your own selfhood. The big other, which again for Lacan doesn't exist, remember the previous class, relates to the idea of the symbolic order, which for Lacan is also the name of the father. Now, all that's very technical, but let's go back to the Northman for the moment. The Northman is presented as a basic revenge drama or a revenge epic in which a young princeling loses his father and then tries to avenge his father and rescue the mother. In that sense, it's not very different, for example, from The Lion King. The Lion King has a similar structure, if you will. And yet, there's something very interesting that happens here, which is that Fundamentally, this revenge fantasy is not so much a fantasy by which the prince becomes the rightful heir, the rightful ruler. Instead, we have no longer a kingdom. Instead, the prince is essentially the ultimate fool in this movie. You could almost compare the protagonist in this movie to one of the protagonists in the Coen Brothers movies, usually played by George Clooney, a kind of witless clown. And this is pretty much the Lacanian aphorism that the ultimate fool is the king who believes himself to be king. The princeling believes himself to be the rightful king and thereby stages a kind of psychotic quest in which everything that he sees and witnesses is further emphasis and further evidence of his fated conquest of his foe. So what, what happens in the movie? Basically, you can get this from the trailer, but the, the king is killed by the uncle. I don't know if that's a spoiler, but basically the uncle takes over and the princeling has to avenge, has to have, wants to avenge the uncle, wants to avenge the father by killing the uncle. Again, we're basically at the same storyline you have in The Lion King or through mm -hmm. Hamlet, mm -hmm. exactly. It's basically that. And yet it is entirely different from Hamlet. The key sequence in the movie, the key sequence in the movie is when the hero, the protagonist, the, the vengeful prince, finally quote-unquote, rescues the mother when he encounters the mother. It's really it's a turning point in the movie, and it's very important because up until then, all the brutality in the movie has been justified by this vengeful quest to save the mother and to kill the usurper, to kill the uncle. And yet, when he meets the mother, we have here in a very Lacanian sense the traditional Lacanian theory of anxiety. Remember, for Lacan, Lacan says that anxiety isn't separation from the mother. Instead, Anxiety is over proximity to the object of desire. In other words, over proximity to the mother. Now, until then, the entire reason to live for this character had been to save the mother. And he has the most devastating traumatic insight once he reaches the mother, which is that the mother is not in need of saving. In fact, the mother does something very cruel, which is that when she sees the son, rather than rejoicing at her rescuer, she says, you're just as big an idiot as your father. You disappoint me because you take after your father. And she says that it wasn't that her father was the rightful king who was usurped by an evil uncle, by Scar. Instead, she says the exact opposite. She says that the father was a vindictive figure of both physical and sexual violence, who was animated by greed, not honor, and that she wanted to be rescued by the uncle, the usurper. This is the exact point at which the ideological fantasy of the princeling falls apart, in which the animating drive of his very existence, which is to avenge the father, having been bereft of the name of the father, the entry into the symbolic order, 
essentially collapses. And so what we see in the figure of the princeling in the Northmen is someone who is essentially Lacanian, Sartrean, psychotic, someone who remains within the realm of the imaginary, an imaginary relationship to the self that has been severed from the relationship to the name of the father. Remember, the name of the father, the symbolic, is never about the direct relationship to the father, the physical father, but rather emerges at the exact point that the father disappears. In this case, because the father is taken from him, the symbolic order, the loop is never closed. We have essentially a short circuit with the imaginary self versus, versus an imaginary father. We have what Lacan would call the psychotic, someone who exists solely in the realm of the imaginary. Now, what makes this very interesting also is that the figure of the mother, instead of wanting to be saved, actually entangles the princeling in a kind of cynical reenactment of the oedipal fantasy which he has. At one point, she approaches the princeling and says, thank you for saving me, begins to kiss her own son in, in an incestuous moment, and imagines that he will kill the, the uncle and that they will rule together, that she, now having been saved by him, will simply become his wife. This is the ultimate traumatic point of reaching the true object of your desire. For Lacan, again, anxiety isn't the separation from the mother. This is actually fuels your drive. Instead, anxiety and the psychotic break of the character is when you reach your object of desire. It's over proximity to the object of desire. And in a very dramatic kiss that the movie stages between the mother and the son, a little incestuous moment, we have the logical conclusion of the hero's journey being reached. And what's really interesting here is that we can go back to one of the key psychoanalytic or classic psychoanalytic truisms, which is almost a little bit crass, but in, in this case, you'll understand why it's interesting. One of the classic psychoanalytic truisms is that our partners, our female partners as men are, I mean, not just as men, but from my own life experience, my female partner is a poor substitute for the mother. That once we realize that within the oidable fantasy, the most horrific breakdown of self would occur when you reach the object of desire, which would be the conjoinment with the mother and an erotic entanglement and the usurpation of the father, we realize that this is not actually what we want. And so instead we find a poor substitute, which is the wife. Could, could doesn't have to be a wife, but of course this is how Freud and Lacan would have written about it. Of course we think immediately, oh my gosh, crass, vulgar Freudianism, sexist, and so on and so forth. And yet there's a fundamentally interesting principle at work here, which relates again to the imaginary and the symbolic. After all, if your relationship to the father and the mother is sustained by the imaginary quote-unquote conquest of the mother, then the failure to do so is in a sense extended by means of having a partner who is the substitute of the mother, who has similar features and hallmarks. And what's important here is that it doesn't have to be a physical copy of the mother. We're not talking about an uncanny Freudian doppelganger. It's not just it's not that, well, I couldn't get my mother, so now I want to have a girlfriend. I mean, that would be messed up. Instead, it's about sustaining that desire, that kind of wishful anxiety around the reunification with that which was lost. And what's so perfect in the movie, The Northman, is that it's exactly at this point, the moment at which the mother kisses the son, thereby unraveling the animating drive, and if you will, the, the animating drive, oh, we lost the internet, the animating drive, and if you will, the ideology that it therefore sustained his very being, his quest for revenge, it's at that exact moment that the movie takes a turn and that he starts taking an amorous erotic interest in the female character. Having reached the mother and turning away in disgust from that which he thought he wanted to obtain, he now finds, again, the, the psychoanalytic mantra that the, the girl is the substitute for the mother, he takes an interest in the woman and decides that he would like to be, have offspring with her. And what's interesting is that there's a little scene right after he kisses the mother and was repulsed from her, the woman he thought he was going to rescue, that he returns to his now to soon to be bride, the female character played by Anna Taylor Joy something. And he says something to her, I thought she was my mother, but she turns out to be a witch. And that's exactly the necessary traumatic point for Lacan, whereby your relationship to your mother becomes symptomatic. The idea being that up until that moment, you desire the mother, but then you realize what you really desire is not desiring the mother, which is the necessary development towards having a partner. And so again, to say, it's not just that your partner is a substitute of your mother, but your partner is a symptomatic continuation of the now repressed desire for the mother. My mother was actually just a witch. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> literal in the movie, which is quite beautiful.
Okay, now I want to get back briefly because we're going to talk about Shizik's theory of violence and about the the two father initiation rites. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not structuring this right well, but there there's a point to the way I'm trying to layer this. Now, we've already talked about the relationship between the ego ideal and the ideal ego, between the imaginary and the symbolic, between the little other and the big other, between the dialectical mediation, between our attachment to the self and our attachment to the so-called name of the father. What's very interesting about one of the scenes in the movie is that we see the uncle with his own child, the uncle who has become king, the Scar character, and he and the son are building a house. And yet it's clear that they are not workmen. They don't have the right tools. They don't really know what to do. And the son is the very, the son is like five years old, has a very commonsensical response. I don't know, maybe he's 10 years old. I don't know. He looks to the father and says, father, why are we doing this? We don't work. We're rulers. The whole point of being a ruler is that we don't work. I don't know how to do this. And the father says, it's very important that we work so that the slaves can see us working. And then the little boy looks around him, sort of dramatically, sees that there are no slaves in sight, and says to the father, Father, there are no slaves watching us. Why are we working? And now we're back at the difference between the imaginary and the symbolic. The imaginary is how you perceive yourself. The symbolic is how others perceive you. But what's so crucial here, and we didn't get to this last week, is that it's not literally how others watch you. It is instead the idea of people watching you. It's the staged gaze. And it's precisely the imaginary gaze, which is another way of referring to the symbolic other. And so here we have what Lacan would essentially have as the chiasmic inversion. It's something that Zizek points towards in some of his work as well which is that we have an imaginary symbolic and a symbolic imaginary. Not only is the symbolic sustained by the imaginary, but the symbolic comes in the form of an imaginary symbolic. This is also why Lacan says that there is no big other. And what's so important here is that it's not just the big other of the pie in the sky god, it's specifically the big other in the form of the lowest form, the slave. Father, why are we acting as if the slaves were watching us? That is the most beautiful rendition of the imaginary symbolic. The imaginary symbolic isn't just saying we are going to do as if the slaves were watching us. It's to say we are going to work precisely because the slaves aren't watching us. And here we come into this kind of undead, uncanny realm of the symbolic, which is that you are now sustaining a performance on behalf of something that you don't, that you know isn't actually observing you, but if you act as if it were observing you, it sustains the imaginary hierarchy and relations. Here we have one of the key differences between the symbolic order in the pagan society and in the post-pagan society, which is here a society of early Christianity. Remember, one of, in the movie, one of the scenes is that there's a fear that Christians have undermined the camp. So we're staging this entire epic already at a moment of turmoil in which the customs and the mores and the logical philosophical order, the symbolic order of the pagan society, is slowly ceding to that of one of early Christianity. Now this relates to the idea of violence, because the purpose and the relationship of violence is very different in the pagan universe as it is to the early Christian universe. One of the, it's kind of funny to me, but like one of the common sense liberal responses to violence today is to see violence as a kind of cycle of violence. Jenlin and I went to a play recently from the International Theater of Amsterdam, uh, which is called Age of Rage, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Age of Rage. And Age of Rage essentially had a liberal take on violence. It was a restaging of various... Uh, six Greek six tragedies. Gre thank you, yeah. six Greek tragedies. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that the violence in these tragedies was seemingly senseless, that it was a spiral of viren violence in which violence kept repeating Violence like a family curse. Like a family curse. Violence begetting violence. Now, what makes this the standard liberal take on violence is that it essentially presumes that violence exists as an, an excess, that violence essentially exists as a kind of exception to the rule, that we have a harmonious and peaceful society mm -hmm. that breaks down into momentary mm -hmm. lapses of violence, mm -hmm. which creates and begets further irrational lapses of violence, and that if we could only take a step back we would realize that actually we can all be friends and we can live in multicultural, harmonious, 
Kantian world peace. What's interesting, though, is that neither in the Greek world nor in the pagan world, which of course are very closely related, did violence follow this logic, which is essentially a liberal logic. Instead, Greek and pagan societies, as depicted in the Northmen, use violence in a highly ritualized manner. Violence, not as an exception to the rule, but as an excessive, traumatic, over-theatrical break within something that cannot be incorporated into the symbolic order. For example, a murder. For example, an attack. For example, mourning dead relatives. For example... Well, becoming a wolf. Yeah, I mean, becoming... Uh, or, even, mm -hmm. or even a peace treaty mm -hmm. has to be somehow marked by human sacrifice or animal sacrifice. And at multiple points in the movie do we see sacrifices taking place that are specifically ritualistic in this precise manner, which is that... They're not violent. And this is secretly, I think, what liberals find so devastatingly scary about the pagan idea of violence, which is that it's violence bereft of meaning. It's not precisely, it's precisely not the kind of violence that today we associate with an abundance of excessive emotion. One of the most horrific things about the way in which a human sacrifice is presented within the Northmen isn't that it is the wailing screaming of an innocent girl who's being, who's having her throat cut out for no reason. It's precisely that she willingly embraces her role within the symbolic order and laying down her life for this ritualistic exercise. And so to go back to the Freudian book on totem and taboo, it's the liberals, the liberals, it's liberal, but li I mean this quite literally, as in like a liberal worldview that sees violence as a taboo Whereas within the pagan society, violence was precisely totemic. Violence was staged, it was theatrically in, uh, put into a scene precisely so that it didn't have to be a systemic part of society or so that it wouldn't become systemic. Now, within the liberal worldview, it's exactly the opposite. We imagine the world being an inherently peaceful place with brutal, exceptional outbursts of violence and yet fundamentally, and this goes back to what we'll talk about with Zizek's theory of violence, this masks the very fact that there are enormous amounts of structural and systemic forms of violence that we find acceptable and totally not outside the norm. That within a liberal worldview, we accept a certain amount of violence as simply being part of society. And that we look at these excessive outbursts of violence and we try to attribute meaning to them. And by means of attributing meaning to them, we try to explain them away. Oh, this happened because of X, and if we address X, then it will no longer occur. And so here, essentially, we have two very different ways of approaching violence. On the one hand, we have the idea that violence is a dramatic theatrical display that is ultimately meaningless, which is how it works within the pagan universe, which for us is horrific, because what we fear more than anything within a contemporary liberal worldview is precisely the idea that violence could be meaningless. And so what we try to do is that we try to imbue violence with meaning. At every stage, we try to find narrative content, a reason, a purpose for violence, either so that we can minimize the potential nihilistic stance that it meant nothing, or so that we can try to solve it by finding the underlying root causes. Now, one of the things that Slavoj Žižek has always argued in his theory of violence is what he calls the hermeneutic temptation. He says we should resist the hermeneutic temptation. Now, the hermeneutic temptation is simply a fancy way of saying that we should resist reading meaning into something. For example, when there's a violent protest or there's a murder, you'll see on television panels being put together in which experts talk about why this happened. Why was there suddenly an attack? Why was there suddenly an instance of police brutality? Why was there suddenly a protest or why was there looting, etc.? And in a sense, not only does this form of media format try to reassure us that what is happening is outside the norm, which in a sense it is, right, because it's this outburst, at the same time it's trying to reassure us that it has a meaning, that it can be incorporated back to the overall structure of society, and if we can interpret it, we can better understand it and we can get rid of it. Now, this is the classic Enlightenment attitude, of course, that if we rationally apply ourselves to a given problem, we can find a solution as to the root causes of that problem. 
Instead, Zizek, in his theory of violence, has a much more radical argument. He says, what if it is precisely these radical outbursts of violence, whether it's police brutality, whether it's protests, whether it's terrorist attacks, that are designed not in a, not in like a evil conspiratorial Illuminati way, but that are designed to essentially reassure us that everything was fine before those things happened. That as long as we fixate our gaze on the appearance of violence in the world, we find something secretly comforting about the fact that it isn't supposedly happening to us right now. This is also why for Zizek, it's much more important to look at the structural systemic undercurrents of day-to-day -day violence, the ways in which people are made to suffer every single day without it being seen deserving of being labeled newsworthy or even considered violent as such. This is also why in the same way that within the leftist critique, the word force isn't just about physical force, but about the various ways in which we find ourselves in caught in strictures, so-called power structures, that violence isn't just about physical violence. It's not just about explosive violence taking place on television. It's also spe specifically the kind of silent and invisible violence that is afflicting people every day. It's the violence of poverty. It's the violence of um, gender inequality. It's the violence of mental health and depression. There are many ways in which we do violence to ourselves and violence is done unto us that is not seem to be deserving of being violence with a capital V. And so Zuzik's argument is that we should resist the hermeneutic temptation. We should resist the ritualistic attribution of, of meaning to violence in order to actually address the hidden underlying causes, not of that violence, but precisely of the violence that we don't accept as violence as such. And this is also basically Zizek's entire idea of the necessity of the critique of ideology. For Zizek, the critique of ideology is never to look behind the curtain of appearances. It's never to say, let's find the secret machinations underlying some kind of government conspiracy or deep state. Instead, it's the exact opposite. It's to say, why are there certain things that we find not worthy of consideration? What are all those things that we think that are that we've all accepted mm -hmm. as being simply part of how the world functions? It's precisely naming the things that are otherwise unnameable and considering those people and their plight who would otherwise be voiceless. That is the purpose of the critique of ideology. It's not to say, here's what we should look at. It's to question the way in which our looking at is structured in the first place. This is also why, as I said in the previous class, ideology is simply the, goes back to the Greek word, the root of the Greek word to see and logos, which is logic or meaning. It's the way in which we infer meaning to that which we see. Now let's go back for a moment to the imaginary and the symbolic, because both the imaginary and the symbolic are ways in which we infer or attribute meaning to what we see. And fundamentally, what we see is, of course, framed by the way in which we see ourselves. You could say this is also for Lacan, the difference between the, um, the utterance and the statements. We have the utterance, which is what we make. It's the sounds that we make, the declarations that we make. And then we have the statement, which is how we're interpreted. It's the way in which we create ourselves retroactively through that which is said. The pagan world, as we can see in the Northmen, is entirely on the level of utterance. So much so that many of the utterances in the movie are bestial utterances. They're growling and screaming and shrieking and reenacting animals, whether it's the berserker, who is the bear man, whether it's the wolf man, whether it's the final scene in which the two characters fight each other, and instead of dialogue, they simply scream at each other in a kind of impotent rage. Here we have the subject reduced to pure imaginary relation to the self, to pure utterance, which ironically within the pagan universe is precisely the imaginary relation of the self to the animal, the tautological short circuit that takes place when you say, I am animal and animal is me. It's also why in the shamanic, shamanistic, whatever, right, the right of passage that we see in the opening of the movie with the son, the pagan son and the pagan father, the son and the king, they have to prove their humanity, not by acting as beasts, but precisely by belching and farting. Belching and farting is the ultimate act of humanity. Even Augustine knew this. Augustine said that what horrifies us is that at root, we have certain urges that are outside our own subjective intent which is a fancy way of saying that things happen to us. For example, Augustine writes about the fact that you can have an erection when you don't want to have an erection. And so for Augustine, the penis and the erection is a constant reminder of the animalistic self. Not I am, here's my manhood, but precisely here's my impotence. 
here is the sign that I cannot control my own urges, that I cannot exercise control over my own body. This, of course, leads us then to the Freudian Lacanian idea, which is, the, we will get to this in other classes, but you already know what I want to say, which is precisely that this is also the castration complex. The castration complex isn't to say, I'm going to pretend as if something were missing. It's precisely to say that it's there, and yet it feels as if it were missing, precisely because it's there. For Augustine, the erection is the castration complex of all la lettre, because in the erection, we don't have the symbol of strength. In the erection, we have the symbol of impotence. The fact that you cannot control your own urges, that your body has a seeming autonomous will of its own, symbolized by the erection, is a symbol of the fact that you lack control on a fundamental level of your own being. This is also how Hegel relates this idea to zombies. I mean, through <laughs> Zizek. Hegel writes about this horror, which is the horror of the automated self. Zizek relates this to zombies. Hegel says that fundamentally, the body works like a zombie, that this is the kind of neurotic, hysterical, nihilistic insight, that you are a machine that takes in food and produces excrement, and that you sleep and you walk around, but fundamentally, that is what you do for most of your life, and you imbue your life with meaning and purpose through imaginary symbolic relations, but that you are simply a kind of machine of habit. And Hegel, of course, is very aware of irony. This is sort of the whole point of Hegelian dialectics is to find ir ironies within life, is to say that it's precisely through habit that we then cultivate our better self, that it requires discipline to create ourself as a person. And yet discipline is, in a sense, the mirror image or the flip side of the coin of the horrific insight that we are nothing but habit, that we are in a sense all robots or the undead going through the motions until we die someday. Again, we see within Hegel here, avant la lettre, the whole idea of the Lacanian, uh, sorry, the Freudian death drive or the tortoise trip. What Zizek would say is at the heart of his Marxism. Essentially, Zizek's Marxism is death drive Marxism, but that's in my book, Five Keys to Zizek. You can find that in my book if you want to read about that. Um, anyway, the point here is that the characters in this ritual, right, this ritual that the, the father and the son have, in which they have to prove that they are human whilst crawling around and pretending to be wolves, how do they prove that they're human? They prove that they're human by belching and by farting. And of course, it is the human gesture par excellence to control your emanations, to willingly emit a fart, to willingly belch. What makes you animalistic is precisely not having control over those things. This is something that Freud writes about in the whole sort of horrific uncanny, which is the uncanny of your own emanations. It's the idea that suddenly that you would, you would have a Freudian slip or you would suddenly fart in public. I was walking down the road today and a man in front of me actually did this very thing. I was walking from the park and a man farted, elderly man, so presumably, you know, medication, etc. And I could see that by farting, he had done something very embarrassing, not because it was a breakdown of, oh my God, this guy farted, but because he had portrayed his weakness. Involuntarily having gas is a sign that you lack control over the most basic part of your being. And so it's a sign of weakness. And here to go back, to, I know I'm, hopefully I'm making sense, but to go back to the Northman with the father-son ritual, here we have exactly the same thing. If the animalistic part of you is supposed to be that which gives you strength, you are like the wolf, then it is at the same time the part of you that betrays your inner weakness. And so what makes you strong is being able to control the animalistic part of yourself. It's not suppressing the belch or suppressing the fart, it's taking control of the belch or the fart. And so here we have again the pagan logic. The pagan logic is essentially to say that the civilizing gesture isn't repression, which is that of the early moderns, the civilizing gesture is to fully embrace your animalistic self. And this is also why the pagan order has a very different relationship to violence. If embracing your human self rests on taking control of your animalistic nature, then violence becomes an extension of that nature. Whereas within the pre-modern self, the idea is that your selfhood is based on repression. It's based on, the, as Freud discovered it, it's based on the idea that you would actually be the result of a kind of ur-repression, which then leads to violent outbursts. The reason that I'm talking about this in a relatively simplistic fashion is that we have here essentially two different ways of looking at violence. 
Within the early Christian universe, what then becomes the pre-modern and modern universe, which you could also call the Freudian universe of the unconscious and repression, violence is symptomatic. Violence is a quote-unquote return of the repressed. It's precisely within the pagan universe that violence is normalized and no longer symptomatic, and instead what is symptomatic of that society is the civilizing order. And so the very contours of early modernity and of early Christianity are symptomatic to the tautological relationship of beast to man and the order of violence within the pagan universe. And what makes the North one so interesting is that we see what happens to the quote-unquote psychotic individual of the princeling who finds himself in between the cracks of this pagan society that is turning into its symptomatic other, which is early Christianity. And it's precisely within that twilight, within that world in which a new order has not yet emerged, that the princely makes absolutely, absolutely no sense. That the princely is the psychotic subject who's detached from the name of the father in a society that mirrors his detachment that has become detached from the name of the father. A society that no longer lives within the order and the logic of the pagan universe, and yet a society that also doesn't live within the logic of the pre-Christian, early Christian universe. And so we find here a society that is completely symptomatic. We find here the outburst of violence in the Northmen have nothing to do with a kind of pagan, romantic, fascist, proto-fascist, reactionary embrace of masculinity and are in fact the exact opposite. They're the hysterical, symptomatic lashing out of a society that has already unraveled from within, of a family that has already unraveled from within, of a hierarchy and a structure that no longer exists. And so the princeling is the ultimate fool. He's the king who believes he is king. He is the character who has imbued himself with the imaginary attachment to his own self, which he finds reenacted through the ideological motifs of the figuration, through Odin's ravens and his fantasy depictions of the Valkyrie, etc. And yet his very strength is the ultimate sign of his impotence. And that is what the movie stages, ultimately. Now, I want to add another thing here, which is that the director himself has made a couple of comments about the film that I find very interesting. One of them is that he believes that the inclusion in the movie of the Valkyrie or of a Valkyrie is possibly distasteful. Those are his own words. He said, distasteful. Not tasteless, but distasteful. So why would the inclusion of the Valkyrie be distasteful in this movie? First of all, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the Valkyrie is a mythic figure, I think from Norse mythology which is essentially a, a woman who rides a flying horse, and she is like an Amazon-type warrior daughter of Odin, I think. Is that I correct? So, so yeah. And, okay, so why, so why would this be distasteful? Now, one of the obvious answers to that question relates to the way in which the Valkyrie has association with fascism, has associations with the Third Reich. Of course, that association itself stems from the work of Richard Wagner and his opera... I suppose you could say, cycle, the ring cycle, the ring series, in which Wotan, the father of the gods, creates a palace for the gods, and from there on forth, everything <laughs> crumbles. Now, it's a housing crisis. You will know the famous tune, The Ride of the Valkyrie, which Jenlin and I recently had the joy of watching perform <laughs> at the, um, uh, what is it, Sheldonian in Oxford, where Bryn Terfel, uh, who famously played the role of Wot Wotan in the Met Ring Cycle in New York, reprised his role as the king in his moment of existential decline. Anyway, that's... I know that when I say this, it's going to be harder for Jeline to edit this class. So sorry. <laughs> Aside. It's all right. Anyway, the, the figure of the Valkyrie for Wagner, uh, you will immediately know the music that goes with it because the music has been used many times throughout cinema history. Perhaps most famously in Apocalypse Now, when the helicopters arrive to wreak destruction on the Vietnamese coast. And they blare the ride of the Valkyrie through the speakers. Um, you might also find some resonances between the ride of the Valkyrie and the Imperial March and Star Wars. For, for some, that might be something that, that you recognize as well. However, the image of the Valkyrie has also very much spoken to a certain aesthetic sentiment within the reactionary right. And if you look online today, you'll see that the Valkyrie is seen as this mythic image and figure of this kind of like fighting spirit. And 
this isn't just the contemporary right. This is also goes all the way back to Hitler's and Goebbels' fascination with Wagner, that Wagner was really seen as the ideal, the one who presented the romantic idea of a mythic German epic selfhood. Now, as Jenlin pointed out to me today in something that you read, is that the word epic itself derives from epoch, which derives from an astronomical term, which is the specific paradox that ensues from observing the heavens from a seemingly fixed standpoint that you occupy on Earth, which itself is, of course, moving. And there's the double layer of paradox by which you are looking at the skies, which are themselves projecting back to you images which have gone back in time. You look at a star and the time that elapsed for the light to come from the star to you, etc. And so in the exact moment that you are looking at the heavens, that you are looking at the stars, you find yourself in an epochal relationship, which is an epochal relationship both to time and space and to your own self, which is that you have to repress the passage of time, and you have to repress the passage of space in order to calculate how you, as a seemingly supposedly fixed subject, can look into the heavens presumably through a telescope. And that's what's interesting about the word epic, is that the word epic has less to do with the idea that it takes place on an epic scale within Romanticism, and has more to do with the fact that it is about the seeming breakdown between the relationship of the subject to the heavens, the relationship of subjectivity to the order that exists in the stars and in the heavens. Now, the image of the Valkyrie within the movie serves to essentially tie together the ultimate image of the ideological fantasy that the princely has. His ideological fantasy is that he will be accepted into the gates of Valhalla, that if he proves himself to be a true warrior who avenges his father's death, that he too will die gloriously and be carried by the steed of the Valkyrie into the gates of Valhalla. Here we have the classic symbolic relationship to the heavens, which is the idea that we have a transcendental sphere, a heavenly gate and palace, and that if we prove ourselves to be worthy mortals, that we will be allowed and granted access into those heavens. Now, the movie does a very good job of, in an almost apocalypse now way, undermining the ideological certainty that this has. One of the key sequences early in the movie is that he stages such a glorious advance upon a defenseless or seemingly defenseless village and then commits what today would be considered a war crime when he burns to death all of the women and children in the village. We have a massive genocide of another tribe, a genocide that is staged as part of the triumphant, glorious hero narrative that will bring him to the gates of Valhalla. It should be clear, even at that scene in the movie, which is one of the first scenes, that we are not dealing with a neo-fascist, proto-fascist celebration of masculinity in the face of supposedly, you know, non-masculine weakness, etc. The movie from the get-go undermines the certainty of this myth. Now here we're back at the idea of the Valkyrie. If the Valkyrie is the quote-unquote problematic, or as the director said, a distasteful figure of this kind of spirit, a spirit which both Hitler and, and Goebbels held to be the ultimate you know, image, the symbol of resurgent, triumphant German virility and spirit, also of course thereby ideologically connecting German Romanticism back to a kind of epoch-spanning uh, history, or you could say Nerd. myth, yeah. essentially the, 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 the bringing into myth the world of the German, the world of the Third Reich into myth. Not only is the Valkyrie a symbol of that, but the Valkyrie is also why the movie is in its final moments essentially a cop-out. Rather than seeing the relationship that the princeling has to the father unravel, rather than seeing the ultimate, in a sense, pathetic nature of the pagan order. The Valkyrie in the final moments represents the redemption of the character, how he is, upon his death, carried into the gates of Valhalla. Of course, we could speculate that this image of his own redemption is simply uh, the result of a diseased mind, of a feverish subjectivity, which, of course, it probably is. And at the same time, the movie at the very end shrinks back from making the properly devastating argument, which is that to hold on to neo-pagan fantasies today is the ultimate form of irrational, excessive denial. A denial of the kind of modern world that we live in, and a denial of the relationship that we have to the idea of, I don't know, I should say to the idea of violence. I'm not being very clear here. What I'm trying to say is that the moment in which the Valkyrie reaches the gates of Valhalla, in which the movie 
climaxes or culminates in the idea that the princeling is now rejoined with his ancestors, that the lineage is unbroken, that the, that the string of fate has not been severed, etc. At that exact moment, the movie succumbs to our own Hollywood ideological expectations of what we think a narrative structure ought to be, which is the redemption of the hero figure. Whereas if you look back at the movie, you can see pretty well that the entire purpose, the underlying narrative and structure of the film, whether it's represented through the two scenes of initiation between the uncle and the young son, performing labor as if the slaves were watching, versus the animalistic rites in which you perform your own manhood by means of bestial emanations, farting, belching, taking control of the bestial side of you, that we have here an argument that's being made very intentionally throughout the movie, which I think is something that you've even seen in his previous movie, about the impotence of the illusion and the fantasy of masculinity. And that violence, and this is where we come to the final argument that I'm trying to make here, which relates back to Zizek's theory of violence, that since violence today is symptomatic, violence is essentially the masculine position. Now, the masculine, I'm not saying that men are violent. That's not my point at all. The idea that men are inherently violent or that men are physically more prone to violence because they're stronger, etc. It's exactly the opposite of that. Instead, if you go back to Zizek's take on Lacan's dictum that there is no female sexuality, what Lacan essentially argues is that the idea of masculinity is the ultimate fantasy, and here's why. Essentially, what masculinity holds is that woman exists, that woman exists on a level that isn't mediated through the imaginary and the symbolic, that woman exists as the stepping into the emptiness of the name of the father, that if we have the ego ideal and the ideal ego, that woman occupies the seemingly empty space between the two that will make you whole again, that mother, that woman represents the lack, and that if we find our way back into mother, literally or not literally, if you will, presents a kind of completeness, a returning to a primordial state of completeness. Now, what Lacan essentially argues within Lacanian psychoanalysis is that if masculinity is the symptomatic response to the impossibility of achieving this goal, then masculinity is thereby inherently a kind of violence. Now let's go back to Zizek's theory of violence, which is important here. Zizek says that violence should never be interpreted literally. Remember, he says we shouldn't succumb to the hermeneutic temptation. We shouldn't say violence is the literal depiction of violence that we see on television. Instead, one of Zizek's most provocative statements has been to suggest that it is in fact Gandhi who is more violent than Hitler. Well, why would Gandhi be more violent than Hitler? It's clearly a totally provocative, outrageous statement, one designed to confuse and probably enrage people. And yet, the reason Zizek is making the argument that Gandhi was more violent than Hitler is because he's arguing that the truest nature of violence isn't the explosive features of physical violence, but it's the power to structurally change the world. In other words, that if the hermeneutic temptation is precisely succumbing to the illusion that graphic depictions of violent are, violence are more violent than the hidden systemic forms of violence, then the ultimate form of violence isn't to change that which is symptomatically presented to you, the hermeneutic temptation, but rather to change the underlying order itself, to change the way in which you approach life itself. And from that logic, Gandhi is more violent than Hitler because Hitler promised a pseudo-revolution, a revolution by which everything would supposedly go back to how it once was, as long as you got rid of the imaginary, illusionary, ideological subject of quote-unquote the Jew, capital J. Gandhi instead, through nonviolence and through nonviolent means, was able to achieve a much more radical transformation of Indian society, precisely because he didn't succumb to the pseudo-revolutionary temptation of saying, I will eradicate the reactionary foe, the enemy, and restore things to how once they once were. Of course, what makes the attachment to the Northmen today precisely reactionary from certain people who misrecognize what the movie is about is that they say that the Northman presents a return to a supposed pure, unadulterated masculinity, a masculinity that is untarnished by the sort of feminist hysteria of modernity, etc. right? This is the same illusion and fantasy that Hitler and Goebbels had about the Ring Cycle, was that the Ring Cycle promised a return to proper German masculinity. Well, but also the woman is revealed to be fundamentally deceitful. Yeah. That's... Exactly, in which everything can remain the same because we've upheld the ideology. Mm -hmm. Here we have, again, the fool is the king who thinks he is king. Here we have 
the character of the pathetic princeling in The Northman, who, reaching the mother, decides that the mother is a witch because the mother doesn't actually, the mother doesn't affirm his ideological narrative by which he is the hero saving her. And of course, this is the kind of hero complex that many people have in their own life, where they're the ones who are rescuing everybody else, and they're simply the pack, the passive victims who have to be the subject or the object of their helpful intent. Now, to go back to what I was trying to say about violence here, is that Lacan says that masculinity is inherently a fantasy, precisely in the same way that the pathetic princeling in the Northling holds on to his tautological relationship to his self, which is, I am father, I am beast. Father and beast are made to be one and the same. And so by embracing his bestial nature, he thinks he is embracing the father. And here we all want to end with very important difference between that Lacan makes between the imaginary and the symbolic, which is how we started this class. Lacan says that not only is the imaginary how we see ourselves, and the symbolic is how we think we are observed by others. Instead, the relationship of the imaginary to symbolic, which again is the small I-O to the big I-O, or the imaginary self versus the name of the father, instead that relationship is about how we want to imitate the father precisely because we believe him to be inimitable. That is the bind, the paradox that Lacan finds the subject in, the so-called split subject. The subject who believes he is imitating the other and yet imitates the other precisely because the other remains inimitable. This is also, again, why the big other doesn't exist, because the big other exists within this projection of I want to be like you precisely because I will never be like you. Now, this doesn't have to be the literal father. In a sense, it could be the figurative father. Think about reading a biography or think about the people who inspire you in your day-to-day -day life. You want to be like them, and yet you don't want to be them. In a sense, you couldn't be them because if you were them, they would no longer be them. This is also the relationship that Lacan says that the student has to the discourse of the master or the discourse of the, um, the teacher, which is that when you're a student, you imagine that the teacher has all the answers. Lacan calls the professor the one who is supposed to know. In the same way, the father is the one who is supposed to know. And yet, if we were to know ourselves, which is, of course, the object of being a student, to be the one who knows ourselves, then the master becomes superfluous, the professor becomes superfluous. And so ironically, the definition of success for a teacher is for the students to no longer require a teacher. The same is true in a sense for the parents. A successful parenting is precisely for the child to no longer require a parent. And now you can start understanding the basic principle of the Oedipal complex, which is that it's in fact the parent, the father, who wants the child to murder him. That once the child no longer requires the father, the child can assume the name of the father. The name of the father is the same thing as the slaves who are watching us who can't see us. The name of the father is the big other who is not there. It is not the father saying, I will teach you to be like me. It is the father who's saying, I will teach you to be unlike me so that you no longer require me. And it's precisely the pathetic princeling in the Northman who is detached from that necessary relation to the name of the father which is not there, the big other, is why he remains the psychotic, helplessly puppeteered by his ideological relationship to the imaginary, which is a tautological relationship between the signs I see, the ravens, etc., being direct messages sent to me by Odin. To go back to Lacan's theory of the psychotic, the psychotic is simply the person who thinks that everything has meaning. Everything is a sign. And so we finally find ourselves in what I believe is the fundamental argument that the movie The Northman makes, which is that the pagan universe is the universe of the psychotic. And that it's within the emergence of the early modern Christian society that we have the emergence of a bestial, tautological, imaginary, psychotic self, which is the pagan self, that emerges into the symbolic order of the new and emerging world, the world in which the master and the son of the master perform the act of labor as if the slaves were watching. In other words, we have the oidable transition by which the father doesn't say, you have to assert me, you have to kill me. Instead, it's saying that I will make you competent in the symbolic order so that I might as well be dead.
And therein we have the relationship between the father and the boy, which remains the psychotic pagan relationship of father and son, and the pre, uh, which is the oidable relationship then, and then the pre-modern Freudian relationship between the father and the son who has been asserted. And all of this was supposed to also relate back to Zizek's theory of violence, which was to say that violence isn't about the physical manifestation of violence, in the same way that within the pagan universe, violence is always supposed to mark graphically and theatrically an exception to the norm precisely so that the norm can remain unchanged, the reactionary approach to violence, essentially the same as the fascist approach to violence. That it's precisely within the liberal modern worldview that violence is seen to be seemingly exceptional so that we can then ignore or disregard all the ways in which the undercurrents of systemic violence continue to be not even recognized as violence as such. And what the movie does is that the movie, I think quite brilliantly, stages the symptomatic middle point, the excessive, unclear, unstructured middle point of a psychotic pagan princeling subject and the emergence of a kind of as of yet unformed modern bourgeois subject that we see taking place in this sheep farm, essentially. Because let's recall in the movie that the king isn't in the hall. He is essentially reduced to being a peasant working the land, upholding the idea of being a king in the field. That's my take. We didn't talk about Doctor Strange, which I know is really <laughs> frustrating because I know that a lot of you probably watched today, so we would talk about Doctor Strange. So my promise is that we'll talk about Doctor Strange on the Discord. Sounds I think. good. I hope I hope that made sense. I feel like we bit off quite a lot there, and like hopefully, if you feel like you can rewatch this or maybe go over it, um, I know that it seems incredibly dense and probably not very well articulated, but trust me, I hope that if you were to look back on this class, you would see that there's an intricately woven point to what I'm trying to say. Perhaps not very well expressed, but there is hopefully some educational value there. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, yeah, we're gonna start on Discord in about five minutes and we're gonna be there for an hour or so. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for starting your week with us and we hope you have a wonderful week. We will see you next Monday. Absolutely, and we're gonna continue this discussion for another 25 minutes, half an hour. 25 on, minutes, I take it all back. <laughs> on uh, Discord. So if you wanna join us yeah. right now on Discord, we're gonna be on Discord. The, if you click the link in our bio, you can sign up. Uh, just $5 for the first tier. Yes. And uh, you can join our community there. If you join our Patreon at the $5 tier, you will receive a link to the Discord. If you haven't gotten it, let me know, send us a message. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you there. So take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And just a final reminder that my short ebook introduction to Zizek, Five Keys to Zizek, Where Nothing is Lacking, is available exclusively on Patreon. If you'd like to read that book, just click the link in our About page or in our bio. All right. Thanks, guys. And I'll see you next week.